Hello and welcome to Jason Live. My name is Patrick Shea. We're back once again with our STEM career series where we connect you with uh, careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. Today's STEM role model, uh, we, we seem to have lost his image. Stand by, we're gonna get him back in just a sec. Paul, I'm seeing you. Hold on one sec. All right, and we're back. This is the excitement of live webcasting. As I was saying, today's STEM role model is Paul Kienak. 17 years ago, Paul was a Jason student Argonaut. Today, he's a crocodile and dinosaur paleontologist. Paul uses a wide variety of interesting tools and techniques to better understand these creatures from the past, including fossil digs, advanced 3D imaging, and experiments with modern day animals. We're going to learn all about that and more in just a moment. But before we do, in case you needed any additional reminder that today's event is live, it is also interactive. Uh, just below this video, you'll see a box where you can send us questions and participate in our polls. We're going to try to get as many of you involved in today's program as possible. But right now, it's time to get Paul involved. Welcome, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's great to be here. Great. Um, so why don't we start off, we, we introduced you as a crocodile and dinosaur paleontologist. Why don't you kick us off by telling us exactly what that means? What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? What are you trying to learn and, and figure out in your research? Well, I'm particularly interested in the evolution of feeding. This is a very important aspect of the lifestyles of animals, how they manage to uh, get a hold of food resources. In the case of crocodiles and dinosaurs, we're often talking about prey items. Uh, and so my research is focused on understanding the ways in which uh, evolution has changed the feeding system, which involves the use of teeth, the use of the head as a way to capture prey, and the use of uh, soft tissues such as jaw muscles that we can't necessarily see easily in the fossil record. Very cool. We've had students sending us questions even before today's event started. Um, a lot of them have to do with dinosaur fossils, so we're going to talk a lot about those. But uh, to get us started, we've got a question here from Adriana. It's a video question. Let's take a peek. I read your interview, and I was wondering, what do crocodiles and dinosaurs have in common? That's a great question. So uh, crocodiles and dinosaurs belong to a group of animals that are called the archosaurs, or the king lizards. And this group includes all modern birds, it includes pterosaurs, the uh, flying reptiles, uh, and it includes today's crocodiles and uh, all of the dinosaurs that you're familiar with. Now, these animals are, uh, we know them to be related because they share a number of physical features. Uh, one among them are uh, teeth that sit in sockets, not unlike our own. Uh, that's been lost in a lot of uh, the uh, birds, including all of the living birds today. And there's some features of their legs that are uh, unique to just that group of, uh, of quote, king lizards. And so studying their uh, living relatives today allows us to build a window to view back into the past and try to understand something about the biology and the lifestyles of these animals in the fossil record. So what, what, we're going to talk a lot about what got you interested in this career and what you, moved you down this career path. But as we're talking about crocodiles and dinosaurs, were you interested in crocodiles and that got you interested in dinosaurs or the other way around? What, what kind of took the lead? Uh, probably not unlike a lot of my colleagues. Uh, I was one of those youngsters that just loved dinosaurs and never really let that go. Uh, in my case, I uh, got interested by uh, doing a lot of drawings when I was a kid, and uh, I was trying to, struggling, in fact, to get the anatomy right. My dinosaurs never looked correct, 
And in the process of uh, reading up on them and figuring out how to do better drawings, I became fascinated with the, uh, uh, the way in which we discover them as paleontologists, people who try to put together the puzzle of how these animals uh, survived, what their lives were like, and how they evolved. Uh, and that drew me into science. And then uh, I began uh, getting interested in, in uh, biology more broadly through my experience with the Jason Project, uh, and then in my undergraduate years studying the uh, feeding of lizards got all of that tied together for me. My interest in dinosaurs, my interest in feeding, and my broader interest in evolution and biology really uh, gelled at that point. And that's where uh, I stepped forward to, to start a research program. Very cool. We've got some text questions coming in. Uh, this one in reference to your, you just mentioned uh, teeth. A um, bunch of students in Ms. Bounds' class want to know, when you find fossils, are the teeth still attached? Are the teeth usually sharp, or are they dull when you find them? Probably the most common kinds of fossils that we find are shed teeth, so teeth that are broken off or have fallen out of their sockets and are just lying uh, in our, uh, our dig site. But sometimes we do find jaws with the teeth still in place, and that's really great because uh, uh, often those teeth will be of different shapes or sizes, and we'll know in what part of the jaw uh, those teeth were located. Um, in uh, the case of how dull or sharp they are, you'd be surprised at how sharp teeth can be uh, even after several uh, 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 tens to 100 million years of fossilization. And these things are uh, very hard. The enamel of teeth is the, the hardest tissues that a uh, animals can generate, and they, they can stay sharp even after they've been fossilized. We've got a couple of related questions here. I'm going to throw all of these at you at once. Um, what is the most interesting fossil you have come across and why? And how many different types of fossils have you found? What were the most interesting or unusual? Probably the most interesting fossil that I've come across is a, what's considered a very bizarre uh, ancestor of modern crocodiles named Simasuchus, which is uh, uh, which means a pug-nosed croc. It's actually a very um, blunt-snouted uh, vegetarian-type crocodile, and it's very strange for a crocodile or its ancestor to have been a vegetarian. We know these animals today as apex predators. Uh, but there was a point in their evolutionary history where they uh, ate mostly vegetables. And we see evidence from this in the kind of teeth that they have and uh, a number of features of the skeleton of this animal that suggest it had a much more sedentary lifestyle than a predator would have. Uh, the kinds of fossils that I've found have spanned fishes, reptiles, uh, birds, and mammals. Uh, you will often find a number of different kinds of animals all in the same location during a dig. We're typically digging in sites that used to be uh, riverbeds or the shorelines of lakes that are visited by all kinds of animals. And so we see evidence for all of those kinds of animals when we start finding bits and pieces of their fossilized remains. And the Simosuchus find that you discovered, um, where were you when you came across that animal? Simasuchus is uh, from Madagascar, uh, which is a large island off of Africa. And it was discovered by my uh, colleagues, or the particularly nice specimen that you showed was discovered by my colleagues uh, at Stony Brook University. And um, the, this animal came out of a, a field site that was on the northern part of the island, uh, on the uh, western shore, in a, uh, a portion of the country that is um, given us a number of great fossils from the latest Cretaceous. This animal is about 95 million years old. And in addition to uh, this pug-nosed croc, there are a number of uh, other kinds of crocodile uh, ancestor animals, as well as large theropod dinosaurs like uh, Majungasuchus, or excuse me, Majungasaurus um, from this area, and uh, evidence of fossil birds uh, that are giving us a, a much better understanding of what the life of uh, animals 95 million years ago was like in the Southern Hemisphere. 
We've got another pair of questions here for you. Chris and Timbo want to know, what's the biggest dinosaur you've ever discovered? And Mrs. Bounds' class asks, what's the largest fossil bone that you have found? The biggest dinosaur I've ever discovered is probably a um, large hadrosaur, and this was in uh, Canada, in the Badlands of Alberta. Uh, that is one of the most uh, rich places in the world to find dinosaur fossils, and uh, hadrosaurs were particularly large dinosaurs, um, and so uh, that location has a great place to find uh, very large dinosaurs. Um, for uh, other locations around the world, you'll find uh, large animals as well. The uh, large theropod from Madagascar um, will probably turn out to be about uh, 20 feet long, um, and we know that animals in the Cretaceous were uh, particularly quite large. One example would be uh, Dinosuchus, the terror croc. Uh, this is an animal from North America that got to be longer than a school bus. It's estimated to have been about 40 feet long and uh, probably was able to take down dinosaurs as prey. And we have evidence of bite marks in dinosaur bones that we attribute to this very large croc. So just like today, crocodiles occupy a, uh, a position in the food chain as the top predator, it's likely that they also occupied that position uh, in the uh, latest Cretaceous. We've got a live question that just came in from Faith Ann. She wants to know, where's the best place to find croc fossils? Crocs are a really wonderful system to work on as a paleontologist because they live in the environments that best preserve fossils. Uh, they're semi-aquatic, and so when uh, their bones um, uh, fall to the uh, uh, pond or the uh, uh, river bottom, they become covered in sediment very quickly, and as a result, they become fossilized quite frequently. We have a really great understanding of the evolution of crocs uh, because of this. And so uh, we often look for fossil localities that are at places uh, where uh, rivers were slowing down, uh, fluvial plains, flood plains, um, or at uh, the edges of lakes where we hope to be able to find uh, these kind of animals in particular. Another live question just came in from TJ. Is there any type of crocodile fossils you have not seen but are really on the hunt for? Oh, that's a very good question. So we know that modern crocs, uh, all of those that are alive today, share a common ancestor 85 million years ago uh, during the end of the age of the dinosaurs. But the uh, Animals that first evolved from that common ancestor, we have a, uh, only a, uh, a small sampling of. And so as we move into the more modern era, we get more and more fossil crocs. And so we have a good understanding of their evolution uh, more recently. But what happened at the emergence of the group that involves all of today's crocodiles, alligators, caiman, and gharial? we don't have a great idea of. And so targeting that region of time is particularly important for trying to fill in the fossil gaps. Great, we've got another video question next. This one is from Andres. What would your job be like without the use of technology? Well, technology has certainly made uh, paleontology uh, a much more integrative kind of science. Uh, today, Paleontologists are often trained in both geology and biology. Uh, we are using computer tools, we're using 3D imaging technologies, we're using advanced statistics, and we're trying to uh, squeeze all the information that we can out of the fossils that we unearth. Uh, the video you're seeing now is a contrast-enhanced micro-CT image of an alligator where we're able to see all of the soft tissues of this animal, in this case, this animal's head, and these slices are moving um, from bottom to top of the animal's head. And we use these kinds of tools to uh, reconstruct soft tissues in the fossil record for animals that only leave us their bones and their teeth. Now, when paleontology uh, first really got going during the, uh, the bone wars in North America, uh, in which uh, new fossil finds were sensational, and we were still really putting together the story of the evolution of vertebrates, uh, there weren't these kinds of technologies. And paleontologists would go spend weeks out in the field 
uh, camping in uh, um, uh, very low-tech kinds of um, uh, uh, laboratories and digging fossils out of the ground and then wrapping them in plaster and burlaps, which we do today still in order to keep the fossils protected as we transport them. Now, for that age of paleontologists, their major goal was to describe the fossils that were coming out of the ground. And uh, without modern technologies, uh, uh, the, the, the focus of paleontology has been very much one of documenting uh, the kind of changes that have occurred throughout the uh, evolution of uh, reptiles, mammals, birds, amphibians, and fishes. Uh, but with new technologies, we're bringing in other sciences. And so paleontology is growing as a field because we're able to integrate across different scientific disciplines. Now, I do want you to, to kind of dwell here for a moment. And I'm, I'm going to go back to uh, some of those images that we just saw. And just talk to us about what we're seeing in those images in a little more detail and how you use those to help answer your big research questions. So uh, we've got the... Again, the, the contrast-enhanced CT scan. This is not the movie version, but the still image version. That you, you can kind of understand a little better what's happening there. Talk us through this. So what you're seeing is the head of uh, a hatchling American alligator. Now, paleontologists are uh, foremost anatomists. Our job is to uh, interpret the anatomy of fossils in order to understand what groups of animals various fossils belong to and how those animals made a living. And one way we do this is by comparing the anatomy of fossil animals to the anatomy of living animals today. And these kinds of contrast enhanced CT images give us just a, a treasure trove of anatomical information to draw on. Uh, for example, these kinds of images allow us to generate three dimensional renderings of both bony tissues and teeth, so the hard tissues that would be present in the fossil record, and the soft tissues through 3D reconstructions, which you're seeing an image of now. So this is the same American alligator specimen. Half of the head has been digitally removed on its left side, and what's been rendered are nerves and muscles. So the brain is shown in dark blue and light blue. The pink are muscles that attach to the eyeball, but the eyeball has been taken out. And the yellow, green, and purple colors uh, are, the ner are a series of nerves that are coming out of the brain, and they're providing different functions to the eye muscles, uh, to the jaw muscles, to the teeth, as well as to uh, a sensory system that crocs have that allow them to sense mechanical uh, waves in their environment. And by putting all of these kinds of tissues together, we can begin to understand why there are certain holes in bones in one place and not another. We can see those soft tissues passing through those holes in living animals and then begin to make inferences or guesses, very educated guesses, about why they're there in fossil animals as well. So this seems like a, a good point to bring up another aspect of your career and your, your current job there at Oklahoma State. Um, tell us about your work with human gross anatomy and the, the future doctors of America. How does that come into play? Well, because paleontologists spend their time poring over the anatomy of a lot of different kinds of animals, uh, we are specialists in the anatomical sciences. And anatomy is the core, the foundational uh, um, uh, class or building uh, block that future doctors are going to need in order to interpret what's wrong with a patient. So uh, a, uh, an anatomical system goes awry, and that results in some kind of a, um, a, a condition that needs to be treated. And so our job uh, as paleontologists here at Oklahoma State University is to begin the training of medical students by teaching them human anatomy. And so this includes the uh, dissection of human cadavers, which uh, we use as a way to teach students what they will find in their future patients. In fact, the students consider that uh, cadaver to be their first patient. And that uh, person has donated their body to science, to science education in particular, uh, so that they may help contribute to the training of future doctors. And in Oklahoma in particular, um, we are trying to train more rural doctors in order to service our uh, community here. And by uh, using uh, uh, dissection to understand human anatomy, uh, those doctors will have a much better ability to uh, determine what's wrong in their patients through their hands-on understanding of human anatomy. 
groups. Now, this has gone back uh, a very long time. Uh, the very uh, uh, first person to really put this together was a guy, you might know uh, his nickname is Darwin's Bulldog. Uh, he was uh, Thomas Henry Huxley. He was a paleontologist in the late 1800s who first linked up uh, paleontologists and students who were interested in becoming doctors. And by training them in anatomy, he was able to help uh, make them uh, better prepared for medical school and for being doctors. And since then, for more than 100 years, paleontologists have played a key role in medical education uh, as uh, anatomists. Never a dull moment in your life, it seems. There's always something exciting going on. And I do have to ask, oh, that's not what I wanted to show. W was he Darwin's bulldog because he kind of resembled a bulldog, or is there <laughs> another reason? He, he's kind of got a bulldog look to him. He does have kind of a bulldog look to him. Uh, I will give him the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> he was uh, referred to as Bar Darwin's bulldog because he was such a vocal proponent of evolution. Uh, he went out and really argued that evolution was the best way to explain the diversity of life that we see both in living animals and in the fossil record. And uh, that's given him that moniker. We are going to take just one more fossil question here, and then we're going to move on. We've got a lot to cover still, and uh, we're getting short on time. Clyde Irwin Elementary is asking, how do you know what a dinosaur eats by looking at the fossils? That's a great question. Paleontologists are detectives in, in some regard to determine uh, the ways in which animals use their anatomy. Um, predatory animals use their teeth for seizing their prey, uh, and their teeth will have certain shapes for doing that. They will typically be long and pointy and very sharp. Uh, animals that are mostly vegetarians will use their teeth to slice and grind up plant matter. And as a result, they tend to have uh, a much greater complexity. The, think of your own uh, teeth in the back of your mouth. They've got lots of ridges and bumps on them, and that's typical of an animal that's processing or eating more plant matter. So shapes, sizes, and uh, the way in which they could be used for um, uh, 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 capturing food resources are the ways that we determine uh, what we think they're being used for in animals that we can cannot actually observe feeding like fossils. All right, we've got a couple questions here. Uh, Ms. Bounds class wondering, what's the most dangerous part of your job? And Nico wants to know, have you ever been bitten by a crocodile? <laughs> well, uh, Mika, I have not ever been bitten by a crocodile, and that is probably the most dangerous part of my job. So uh, in order to understand how feeding evolution has occurred in this group of related animals, in crocs and in dinosaurs, uh, I do a lot of work with living crocodiles, alligators, and their relatives in order to uh, assess how the anatomy of their jaws produces bite forces and how those bite forces are used to uh, capture their prey items. And so this uh, involves uh, capturing um, large alligators and crocodiles. Uh, it involves actually uh, measuring their bite forces by having them bite down on uh, a kind of a bite force meter, which uh, would be a very expensive kind of bathroom scale, would be a good analogy for that. And that bathroom scale tells us how much force their jaws can generate uh, when they bite close. And uh, the purpose of this is to understand the, uh, the way in which animals that are apex predators, like crocs and alligators, how they are able to occupy that role in their environment. Now, we know that these animals uh, hunt large prey, uh, like large game animals, such as deer. And in order to capture those prey, they need these very high bite forces. The animal that you're seeing now uh, generated a bite force of around 2,500 pounds. Uh, that's about the weight of, say, a Mini Cooper. Um, the largest crocodiles that are alive today, the saltwater crocodile, can generate bite forces of around 4,000 pounds. And so imagine that much force, the weight of a large truck uh, being rested on your leg, but over the area about the size of a quarter. That's the, the kind of um, abilities these animals have to uh, capture their prey uh, using these very high forces. Pretty terrifying, if you ask It is me. pretty terrifying. Yeah. So do you, are you scared when you're doing those kind of tests? 
Uh, no, we uh, have a number of very well-trained uh, scientists in my research group, and we've been working with these animals for a very long time. Uh, we understand how they move. Uh, we know when to back off. And we do everything we can to uh, protect ourselves. It's, it's not very different than, say, being a high-rise construction worker. You do the same thing the same way every time, and you don't get hurt. Makes sense. We're going to uh, shift gears a little bit with this question from Kathy. She's an elementary school student and wants to know, uh, can you tell me how you use math in your job, and what kinds of math do you use? So paleontologists, biologists in general, uh, rely very heavily on statistics in order to test the questions that we have. So what statistics does for us is it gives us a mathematical ability to say whether or not the answer to a question uh, is what we expect it to be or what we expect it not to be. And we use this kind of an approach to determine if the, uh, th the things we think are true about the living world actually are true. So statistics are quite important. In addition to that, because I do a lot of 3D imaging work, understanding how to use um, matrices, so big uh, uh, columns and rows of numbers, how to manipulate those is very helpful. And we have computer programs that do that for us, uh, but understanding the underlying mathematics to it is what allows us to be sure that those programs are telling us the kinds of answers that make sense. We're going to jump to our next question from Mara. She says, I think that learning about dinosaurs is always awesome and cool because it's so interesting to learn about extinct animals and dinosaurs. What really surprised you when you learned about dinosaurs? Well, I grew up during the period of time when people, paleontologists, were still arguing about whether or not birds were dinosaurs and where birds came from. Uh, so for me, I think the uh, most surprising and perhaps most interesting aspect of um, learning about fossil organisms is that we tend to think that dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. And in fact, today they are the largest group of animals that lives on land. There are more than 10,000 species of birds, and those are all dinosaurs. And so uh, deriving from or evolving from the image of this very first dinosaur that you're seeing here, Tawa, uh, we now have an enormous diversity of uh, living dinosaurs from the robin that's outside eating worms as spring comes uh, to very uh, amazing birds like a peacock with its large tail or a falcon which can uh, dive as a predator at speeds um, that uh, are remarkable that any animal could achieve. Uh, to a tiny hummingbird that can hover in place and uh, feed on uh, nectar from flowers. And these are all dinosaurs that are alive today, and, and that still, I think, uh, gives me pause at just how amazing that group of animals really is. Somewhat related question here from Legacy. Why do you think alligators and crocodiles survived the dinosaur age? Oh, that is a question that plagues us as paleontologists. <laughs> Why some animals made it through the extinction that killed the dinosaurs and why others didn't isn't something we really have a handle on yet. Uh, there isn't a common thread among all of those animals that we've been able to figure out that would really um, help us answer that question. And, and this is why uh, we are constantly trying to find more fossils to answer questions like that and why we're constantly looking to recruit new um, of wonderfully curious and brilliant minds into our field to help us uh, get at those kinds of questions that we just haven't been able to answer. We are going to uh, shift gears a bit. We've been talking a lot about your current research, uh, things you do in your day-to-day -day job. We want to talk about now uh, how you got to where you are today. And we're going to jump into that with a question from Jeremy. What inspired you to go on the path of becoming a paleontologist? talked a little about, about this earlier, but um, give us the full story. Sure. So uh, for me, uh, what really helped solidify my interest in becoming a scientist was my own participation in the Jason Project. So when I was uh, in high school, when I was 14 years old, uh, I was chosen to be a student Argonaut uh, in part of Jason 8, which traveled to Yellowstone National Park 
and compared the geology, the fauna, and the flora to that of Iceland. So comparing uh, a, um, a caldera, so Yellowstone uh, is a, uh, a large um, geologic uh, uh, volcanic kind of um, uh, uh, area, and comparing that to a volcanic island, uh, Iceland. And uh, as part of the Jason project, my uh, task was to um, understand the biology of Yellowstone and Iceland and to uh, present on the differences between those kinds of animals and how the geology of those areas affected their, uh, their lifestyles and their uh, evolution. And for me, uh, the Jason Project strongly solidified my uh, desire to become a scientist. I really enjoyed um, that kind of, uh, uh, of interaction with people. And the idea of becoming the, uh, uh, someone that could figure out the way in which parts of the world worked or being the first person to see a new animal that was buried 80, 100 million years ago. I thought that those were uh, really uh, amazing ways to spend your time. And as I uh, became more educated on what being a scientist was like, I became even more engaged with just the diversity of animals that we have on the planet and the very many ways in which they're both similar and different and, and trying to understand how life on Earth came to be as we see it today. And I think that that's a very important role that scientists play to try to give us an understanding of uh, who we are as people by helping to fill in the gaps of how we are related to the animals around us, uh, how we're different from them, and what our shared histories have been. I'm going to jump to this next question from Christina. What's the most interesting thing about your job? Wow, the most interesting thing about my job. Um, I think this might sound a little uh, lame, but it's uh, going into uh, a museum and um, visiting the collections, the, the fossils that are in the back of the museum that you don't necessarily get to see when you're uh, visiting it, uh, and seeing the, uh, the history of the people who've come before me um, laid out in the, the names of who've collected these fossils. Some of these fossils are collected uh, 150, 200 years ago, and we still have them in collections and they're still studied today. And just getting a sense for how, uh, as a paleontologist, I'm part of a long chain of scientists who are working towards a better understanding of how our planet came to be in the way that we know it today. I just, I, it, for me, it's a very uh, poignant part of my job. We have a video question from Stacia that's a, a pretty nice follow-up to what you were just discussing. So let's take a listen. Why do you think it's important to have a new generation of doctors and vertebrate paleontologists to help you with your research? Why is it important to have a new generation of paleontologists? The... Uh, the best part about, what I think is the best part about science is that we are constantly bringing new people into the field. And those people don't have the old points of view that have lingered in that field for a very long time. And so they challenge the ideas that came before them. And it's through that process of challenging old ideas that we advance our knowledge. And so bringing new people in, training them, uh, in the methods and tools that we develop to understand the world around us, and um, giving them the ability to go and ask their own questions about the natural world and test those questions using the mathematical tools, the computational tools, and just the, the uh, rock hammer and pick kind of tools that we use to dig up fossils uh, allows us to move for our knowledge forward because we're constantly reassessing whether or not what we think is true really is, but we're doing it by bringing in new, fresh minds uh, who are able to reframe what we know about the world based on the new knowledge that we're always gaining. Jacob's got our next question here. He might be one of those new, fresh minds. He says, is there any advice that you would pass on to a student interested in paleontology, and what would that be? So for paleontologists, um, if you would ask this question maybe 25 years ago, 
the answer would have been to focus on geology. But uh, paleontologists now are very much gaining a, um, uh, a, a new uh, set of skills, and that's focused heavily on biology. And what we're really uh, doing now as a field is bringing together geological sciences and biological sciences and trying to meld them to understand paleobiology or how the life of these animals was lived in the fossil record. And so my advice would be to uh, focus on both biological and geological science classes, but also to focus a lot on mathematics classes, because uh, inevitably we are moving towards a uh, more uh, computer-heavy and statistically mathematical-heavy uh, use of uh, paleontology to get at these kinds of questions about the fossil record. And those, those toolkits, those knowledge kits that you develop as a student help you as you begin to pursue your, uh, an interest in paleontology and potentially move into the sciences just as a career. Uh, all of that will benefit you. And so my suggestion then would to be to stick with science classes if you really like science and to stick with math classes because that's the basis for science has become uh, a good understanding of mathematics. Our next question here is from Kristen. And if this is the same answer that you just gave, that's OK. We can just move right along. But Kristen's asking specifically uh, about advice for her kindergarten students about choosing a future career. And, and this could be any career, paleontology or, or really anything out there. Uh, could they choose to do what you do? What, what would you say to kindergarten students at this I point? Wasn't I wasn't much older than, uh, than being in kindergarten when I decided that I wanted to be a scientist or I was interested in being a scientist and particularly interested in paleontology. And uh, I think once you have that, once you have an interest in an, in an area, be it you were interested in science because of medicine or because of paleontology or engineering, that you really... Uh, just want to, as an educator, nurture that interest in any way possible. Uh, for me, art was a major venue to uh, become interested in paleontology. Uh, anatomists and paleontologists today are often gifted artists, and part of what we do is to uh, present anatomy in drawings or in computer-aided uh, renderings. And uh, you'd be surprised at the number of ways in which uh, things you might think of as peripheral to science itself actually help to facilitate both the doing of science and the communicating of it. So any kind of uh, a focused interest for any career path, uh, begin to tie in other aspects of, of what you do into that interest. If it's um, doing becoming a doctor, uh, drawing the human body is a great way to get at that. If it's uh, becoming uh, technologists and, um, and writing programs, uh, exposure to computers is a great way to do that. It doesn't have to be the thing that we do today, for example, as paleontologists, because uh, your kindergartners will come along and when they reach uh, their uh, uh, career as, say, a paleontologist, they'll be doing things that I haven't even dreamed of yet. And they'll be bringing that knowledge base that they developed as students along with them to do things that we can't do yet because of technology or because of fossils that have yet to be discovered. Great advice. Um, we've asked you a lot of questions, Paul, and uh, we, we're, we're actually gone a little long already. So we're going to move on now to our poll questions. These are questions that Paul came up with uh, for you guys out there. And we're going to jump to our first one right now. Paul has dug up dinosaur fossils in one of these three places. Is it A, China, B, Madagascar, or C, Australia? So we're going to ask you to uh, just go to that box just below the video window and enter your answer. I'll give you a hint. We have talked about this place today during today's program. Paul mentioned that a couple of times. We've got answers coming in, Paul. So far, 87% are saying Madagascar. We've got some votes for Australia. Nobody thinks China just yet. We'll give them just a few more seconds here to get their votes in. Um, but as I'm watching the votes come in, that, that is holding. 90% think Madagascar. Paul, what's the right answer? 
The right answer is B, Madagascar. There you go. All right. We will move on to poll number two then. How forceful are the bites of large alligators? Is it 40 pounds? Is it B, 400 pounds? Or is it C, 4,000 pounds? Yet again, it's, it's nice when we do these polls at the very end of the program rather than the middle because uh, we have talked about this one as well. Votes are coming in already. They're, they're fast on the trigger there, Paul. Um, <laughs> about 10% think 400 pounds. Nobody thinks 40. Oh, we got a couple of votes for 40 now. But again, 90% think 4,000 pounds. Is that the right answer? That is the right answer. 90% of you guys are correct. Very cool. We'll move right along to poll number three. As a paleontologist, why does Paul study both living and fossil crocodilians? Is it A, he uses living animals to better understand the fossil ones? Is it B, there aren't enough fossil crocs? Or is it C, fossils are boring? What do you think out there? Everybody, go ahead and place your vote. Seems like a pretty sharp bunch out there today. I don't know if we're going to stump them on this. Uh, we've got 93% saying A so far. There are, uh, let's see, 12% now think fossils are boring. Uh, that, that's just going to happen, I guess. But uh, the vast majority of our audience clearly has been listening to you today, and they're, they're voting A. 93% right now think A. What's the correct answer? Well, A is the correct answer. All right. Well, that is actually all the time we have today. Paul, this has been fascinating. We really appreciate you taking so much time out of your schedule um, to help inspire the next generation of scientists and, and potentially paleontologists. Absolutely. I had a blast. I did, too. Well, we are going to move right along and talk about next week. Our STEM role model series continues with a live event featuring Tectonic Fury curriculum host researcher Walter Smith. Walter is a geophysicist. He works out of NOAA's laboratory for satellite altimetry. Uh, using satellites that measure wave height, Walter and his team are able to determine the topography of the ocean floor. The maps they create via this process help answer questions such as how many volcanoes are beneath the ocean surface? You'll be able to ask Walter Smith that question and others regarding his STEM career during our live event next Thursday, March 13th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. That is all the time we have for today. Once again, thanks for joining us. My name is Patrick Shea for Jason Live. We'll see you next time. Take care.